I've been using this 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro in my day job as a data analyst over the past year. And recently I just upgraded to this 14 inch M1 Max MacBook Pro and this thing is really powerful. But are these new M1 Maxes and also M1 Pros worth the inflated cost? Or are you better off sticking with something like the M1 Mac or better yet, even just a Windows PC? So let's investigate how these new M1 chips perform and using the tools we need for our job. What up data nerds? I'm Luke, a data analyst. And my channel is all about tech and skills for data science. And I use a variety of tools for data science on my M1 Mac, including such things as Python for analytics and some basic machine learning, Tableau for data visualization, and Excel when my boss forces me to. I even dabble with a lot of virtualization tools, such as virtual machines to run Windows so I can run one of my favorite applications, Power BI, and also Docker to run containers for some of my data engineering pipelines with things like Python and Apache Airflow. But as much as the hype as these machines have had, there are a lot of shortcomings and issues that I've run into when using these specifically for data science. And a lot of these issues really stem from how Mac recently shifted from Intel chips to their own designed M1 chips. And I've really seen over the last year, a lot of these issues get fixed, but I wanna address some of them today. So for this, I'll be sharing my experience for using both these machines for data science. And hopefully by the end, you'll have a better understanding of which M1 chip you should be going with, or if you should be maybe considering just going with a Windows PC instead. Since there's so many tools that can be used for data science, we're gonna be looking at them in buckets, if you will. First, we're gonna look at is programming languages, such as Python and R, and we'll also go into machine learning. From there, we'll go into some common data visualization tools like Tableau and Power BI. Next, we'll move into virtualization tools like virtual machines and containers. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with other popular tools such as Excel, SQL, and the terminal. As a quick overview of the Macs that I've actually tested this on, I've been using this 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro with 16 gigabytes of memory and an eight core CPU. And this is what I've been using over the past year as a data analyst. For my new Mac, this is a 14 inch M1 Max MacBook Pro with 64 gigabytes of unified memory and a 10 core CPU. The amount of memory that this Mac has is slightly overkill and we'll discuss more on that later. Because the M1 chip and also the M1 Pro and M1 Max are all on that same ARM architecture of that chip, if an application works on one, it's also gonna work on the other. The main difference between this comes down to performance, which is shown here, shows how the M1 Pro and M1 Max chips can perform up to 1.7 times better than the M1 chips, and also an Intel i7 chip. Another way to show this performance is through benchmarking tools such as Geekbench, where you can actually use these tools to analyze the CPU performance of different chips. The Geekbench test is based off of a thousand point scale where the baseline of a thousand is off of an Intel i3 processor. And it really shows how these different chips stack up against each other. For example, we can see how the new M1 Pro and M1 Max chips perform relative to the M1 chip and also to other computers that are working on an Intel i7 or i9 processor. All right, so let's start looking at tools and we're gonna start with programming languages first. The most popular languages right now in data science are Python and R. So that's what I really focused on. For R, I have it installed with R Studio, and I can say that it's worked seamlessly on both of these Macs. For Python, I use the Anaconda distribution because it is able to manage all the different environments I need, and it also has all the different packages that I need for data analytics. For my text editor, I've been using VS Code, although I have used Atom and also PyCharm in the past on my M1 Mac. Overall, I've had zero issues with package or library support for Python using these Macs. I did perform a speed test running a Jupyter Notebook on both the M1 and the M1 Max, and the results were shockingly close, with the M1 Max only performing 4% faster than the M1. To be honest, for what I'm doing as a data analyst, it already only takes seconds or minutes to run these type of scripts anyway. So in my opinion, if you're using Python in a similar manner that I'm using it, I don't really see the need to spend the extra money to get that M1 Pro or M1 Max chip just for a slightly improve in analytic speed for Python. Now it is a slightly different story when we get into machine learning. With Python, you can actually use tools that take advantage of the GPU on these new M1 chips. And so TensorFlow and PyTorch, uh, 
So TensorFlow and PyTorch are both two popular options used for machine learning, and they've both been redesigned in order to work with this M1 chip. Jordan Harrod did some really impressive testing using TensorFlow on her YouTube channel. And it was really interesting to see how the M1 chips stacked up against each other and also to other common GPUs, such as the Tesla V100. As expected, based on the different GPU sizes, the M1 Max performed better than the M1 Pro and that performed better than the M1. But none of them obviously performed as well as Nvidia's Tesla V100. So when it comes to getting one of these new M1s for machine learning, it really depends. I agreed with Jordan's recommendation, where she said that for researchers and those in the tech industries working on larger machine learning models, the difference in the speed of these M1 chips isn't really gonna matter as you're typically gonna be training your models on some sort of remote machine. Now for those that need to play around with machine learning models locally, or maybe they're competing in some sort of Kaggle competition, you may wanna consider getting that M1 Pro or M1 Max, but I really feel that M1 is already strong enough. For those hardcore machine learning experts out there that are looking for a machine to actually train models on, I'm gonna recommend that maybe if you're needing something that robust, you may wanna consider going with like a Windows PC or a Linux machine so that way you can take use of cut of processing and using something like a NVIDIA GPU. Enough with programming languages, let's actually get into data visualization tools. And once again, we have two popular options for data visualization tools right now, and that is Tableau and Power BI. There is also a third place of Google Data Studio, but you can access that via web browser, so I really didn't consider that for this. So let's start with the good news of Tableau. The Tableau Suite, so Tableau Desktop, Tableau Reader, Tableau Prep, and Tableau Public are fully supported on the M1 chips. Personally, I've been using Tableau Desktop on the M1 Mac, and also I have another Dell that I use, and I really haven't noticed a difference in speed and performance of these two machines when handling Tableau Desktop. Regarding the performance of the M1 Max, I have noticed a slight increase in performance. Once again, those performance gains are only slightly noticeable, so I really can't push this one over this one based on those slight gains. All right, so now let's get into the bad news, and that is Power BI. Power BI is a Microsoft product and isn't only supported to run on Windows operating systems. Previously, when MacBook had the Intel chips, it supported dual booting your MacBook, and that meant you could install both a Windows operating operating system and a Mac OS operating system. So that was a workaround to install Power BI on your Mac. Now with this switch to this ARM-based processor and licensing issues, this dual boot is no longer allowed on these M1 Macs. So we have to look to other options such as virtual machines in order to support the operating system of Windows on the Mac OS. So let's actually shift ahead and start going over the virtualization options for a Mac. And we'll go back and touch on that Power BI option while we're going through this. Virtual machines allow you to install another operating system inside of your own operating system. So in our case, we want to install Windows inside of Mac OS. Because of a lot of the work that I'm doing in Windows, specifically in Power BI, is pretty important to me and I don't want Windows crashing, I decided to go with the most stable option for virtual machines right now for the M1 chip, and that is Parallels. Parallels is super easy to set up and get running, and I even have instructions below and also a 14-day free affiliate link for Parallels for you to try out. So I've been using Power BI installed in Windows on Parallels on this M1 MacBook over the past year, and I really haven't noticed that many issues with it, and I felt like the performance has been pretty good. Over the past year, I was using a previous version of Parallels, so Parallels 16, and I did notice it was slightly laggy when using Power BI, especially for larger data models. But since I've upgraded to Parallels 17, I really haven't noticed this lagginess uh, when using Power BI on the M1 Mac. Now, when it comes to using Parallels on the M1 Max chip, I can definitely notice an increase in performance and I don't notice any lag whatsoever on this M1 Max. So closing out that previous section for Power BI on a Mac. Yes, Power BI can work on a Mac, but it requires a workaround with a virtual machine such as Parallels. This is also a popular option if you need to install other Windows-based applications such as SQL Server Management Studio, SAS for Windows, Microsoft Access, and even Alteryx. But let's get back to testing that M1 Max performance for using those virtual machines. If we look at the M1 Mac itself, for Geekbench, it scores around a 7,000. 
Now for the virtual machine itself that I tested inside of this M1 Mac using eight gigabytes of RAM and four core CPU, it scored around a 5,000 on Geekbench, which is pretty good for a virtual machine. Now, when we look at the M1 Max, which I use for this, whenever we, the core score for this is around 12,000 for the Geekbench score. Whenever I put the virtual machine on it, allocating it to around 32 gigabytes of unified memory and six cores, it scored a whopping 7,000 on the Geekbench. So basically the same store of this M1 Mac by itself which is pretty impressive. Now, when I downgraded the virtual machine to only use about eight gigabytes of RAM and four cores, it scored the same as the virtual machine on this M1 MacBook, which was around 5,000. Having used Windows on both these machines, I can say without a doubt it is faster than the M1 Max, but I don't know if the price is really worth that money unless you're heavily working in Windows all the time. Last up in virtualization options are containers. Containers are really growing in popularity in the data science field for the ability to build applications within this container, if you will, and then you can build it locally on your computer, and if you need to, you can put it somewhere like the cloud. Now, I personally use these containers in order to build some sort of ETL pipeline in order to maybe move data or do some data transformation from one location to another. Anyway, the most popular container tool is Docker right now. And earlier this year, it was actually rebuilt in order to work for the M1 chip. Since I've been using it on my M1 and also M1 Max chip, I haven't really noticed any issues with it and thought it's been performing pretty well. Alexander did a review on his channel comparing Docker performance on the different M1 chips. And it was very interesting to see that the core M1 chip, specifically it was a MacBook Air, kept up with the M1 Pro and M1 Max chips just fine. So based on seeing how close the performance were this, my money's still on that M1 chip if you need to build and use containers. Okay, the last section to talk about is other analytical tools. So we've already talked about performance a lot already. We're gonna be going through this section a lot quicker. First up is Excel. Microsoft has a specific version of Excel built for the Macs itself. And I've been using it over the course of the year and think it's been pretty fine as in regards to performance. However, if you need to use more powerful tools of Excel, such as like Power Query, Power Pivot, or VBA, you probably should consider switching over to Windows for Excel because a lot of those core tools aren't actually supported fully in Excel for Mac. In this case, I would once again recommend using that Windows option via Parallels or even maybe even using a Windows machine instead. Or a better workaround is maybe just switch to Google Sheets. All right, next up is SQL, and SQL is the language used in order to manage and query a database. There are a lot of different popular database management systems out there, such as Postgres, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, SQLite, and also MongoDB. I found that all these different options work on the M1 chip with the exception of Microsoft SQL Server, which you need some sort of virtualization option such as a VM or a container for it to work on the M1 chip. Now regarding the other SQL options, I personally use Postgres and I've been using it and find that I've had no issues on my M1 or M1 Max chip. The last tool to talk about is the terminal. And specifically, nothing's really changed with the terminal. It works just fine. Mainly I wanna talk about uh, the package management system for this and I use Homebrew. Homebrew previously, whenever we upgraded to the M1 chip, it wasn't supported. It has since been upgraded to work with these M1 chips and I've had no problems installing and using the terminal via Homebrew to install new packages. So let's move into my final recommendation. As you can tell from this video, I've really been pushing that core M1 chip and I feel that that chip alone is gonna satisfy the need. Now for around a thousand bucks, you can get a MacBook Air with the M1 chip with eight gigabytes of unified memory. And I feel like this is the perfect starting computer if you wanna work with a Mac in data science. It's gonna be more than enough to perform analytics with programming languages, run native apps such as Tableau or VS Code, basically anything that doesn't really require a VM or a container. Now, when we start getting into those sort of options of VMs or containers, or even maybe you have to run a plethora of applications all at the same time, at that point, I would recommend upgrading the unified memory because you can't change it later, upgrading that unified memory to that 16 gigabytes. 
but really my money is on that MacBook Air. I have that 13 inch MacBook Pro and really the only two extra features that I feel that uh, warrant the extra cost are that touch bar and the fan and I don't use the touch bar and Additionally, I've never really heard my fan come on so because of those two reasons I don't think it's worth the money to get the MacBook Pro. I would stick with that MacBook Air now what about that special case that when would I consider getting an M1 Max or an M1 Pro? Uh, keep in mind that this has a 10 core CPU instead of an eight core CPU of the M1 chip. And also you can get up to 64 gigabytes of unified memory versus only 16 gigabytes of unified memory. The only really case that I would consider upgrading to this M1 Pro or M1 Max is if you're using virtual machines such as Windows pretty heavily for your job, or maybe you wanna do maybe more intense machine learning. Even in that case, I would probably start to consider just switching over to a Windows PC because it sounds like you need more of a Windows machine anyway. So I'd highly consider just going in that direction instead and saving some money. So you're probably like, Luke, why did you get the M1 Max then if the M1 chip is more than enough for data science? Well, because I'm a YouTuber and I wanted that extra performance of that M1 Max chip. Also keep in mind that this Pro and Max chips were specifically designed for those that, if you will, create content or are doing more pro work. So it has things like I need, like an SD card slot, an HDMI slot, and things like that. It also supports dual monitors. So that's the reason why I ended up upgrading to it. But all of those reasons don't really pertain to data science. So that's why I wouldn't recommend to, to most people. The last major selection to make for these machines is what size storage to get. For this, I would go to see how much storage you're currently using on your Mac. And also keep in mind, if you're gonna be using things like VMs or containers that eat up a lot of space, maybe you need to allocate more. So for those in situations, I would recommend having at minimum about 512 gigabytes of storage. So remember, you can always add external storage later. So storage to me isn't a big of a concern. It's the memory you need to worry about. And if you have the money, spend it to invest in it to get that extra memory. So as always, if you found this video useful, smash that like button. And with that, I'll see you in the next one.